So the, one of the problems in talking with a, an audience as diverse as this is to make sure that there are things in it for everybody. And so I'm going to try to do that. I remember being at a gathering where Erica Goldstein was there and um, in rapture about basic science. So I thought it was a very unusual experience, actually. I mean, for those of you who know Erica, you know that this is not always her fave. But uh, so I, you'll have to excuse me if I've tried to please Erica just a little bit by having a little bit of basic science and at the same time, uh, please those of you who are a little bit uh, uh, less clinical uh, with some more clinical uh, aspects of, of things. Um, so I understand I have to give a disclosure. I'm the director of the College and Diagnostic Laboratory here, which actually makes, does a lot of testing about which I'll be talking. And the studies shown here provide part of my salary. I wish I owned stock in something that actually made money. Uh, and there are a number of other laboratories that uh, do many of the kinds of studies that I'm going to be talking about. So not to disappoint you, it's always helpful to start on a clinical note. Uh, this is a family, or part of a family that we saw in the clinic. Uh, the index patient here is a 79-year-old man who was referred to us, uh, I think, by our cardiology group. Uh, he had an aortic dissection at age 60. Uh, he had a repair at uh, 68. Uh, he uh, had multiple myeloma that was in remission. Um, his mother died of pancreatic cancer. His brother died of breast cancer. And he had a niece who had a BRCA1 mutation. So he was coming to us for sort of double duty. One was actually the question about breast cancer in the family and was he or other people in his family at risk. But the other, the secondary issue was <clears throat> what about um, aortic disease in his family? And it was prompted in large part because his son, who was 43, had died uh, in the preceding year of an aortic dissection. That son had uh, three children. The first had died in the very early um, uh, days of life and had um, an unusual uh, endocardial uh, uh, fibroblastosis. It wasn't clear whether there was anything there. Um, after he died, all of these people had had echocardiograms, all of which were normal. He had a very large aorta when he dissected and died. And uh, when his aortic dissection was recognized, he had an aortic diameter that was uh, well above 50 uh, millimeters. So a large one where the upper limit of normal would be expected to be about <clears throat> 37 millimeters. So he represents an issue <clears throat> in terms of clinical care. Um, what do we do about these two people? Um, and we can have them because they are Potentially, I mean, here's a guy with an aortic aneurysm. He has a son with an aortic dissection. So this looks, it has a genetic smell to it uh, in the sense that there are a couple of people in the family that, that uh, are affected. Um, of course, to a geneticist, everything has a genetic smell to it. Um, <clears throat> these people seemed not to be affected. But what about the remaining children here? So there are a couple of alternatives. One is that uh, we can simply echo them every year or every other year or however often we decide we're going to do that at about a couple thousand dollars a shot, make a lot of money for the medical center, um, and or at least make some money for the medical center that we don't ever see. You understand that it disappears over it's somewhere over there. I'm not sure where. Um, or can we do something that's going to make a difference? And that's part of what we're going to talk about as we go on, and we'll come back to this family in a, in a little bit. Here's another uh, story, the young woman, a 32-year-old woman with scoliosis, pectus carinatum, ectopia lentis, no family history of uh, similar involvement. You all know what she has. It's uh, no secret. Her echocardiogram, however, was normal. She had an echo. Uh, an aortic root of 32 millimeters, 
were able to look back over records for the preceding several years. She'd had no change over that time. She'd been taking no medications. She was an avid runner. She wants to compete in marathons. What do you do? Okay. So we'll come back to that in a little bit as well. <clears throat> Once upon a time, and there are a few people in the room who might be old enough to know this, that ascending aortic aneurysm was basically equated to Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome was identified in the early part of the 1900s, whether the patient that Marfan studied actually had what we would now call Marfan syndrome is an open question, and perhaps she had contractual arachnidactyly due to mutations in a different fibrillin gene and not in fibrillin 1. And if you read the literature, you know, up until 30, 35 years ago, it was replete with uh, discussions about Marfan syndrome, Horn Frust of Marfan syndrome. Everything was Horn Frust of Marfan syndrome. Anybody that had an, had an uh, aortic aneurysm had a Horn Frust of Marfan syndrome. And this may or may not be true. Uh, it's not exactly right, but you'll see that there are ways of integrating things and in that some of these old terms, although they're really, you know, from our point of view of really trying to understand what's going on are not right, have a certain flavor to them that says, hmm, there's something going on here. Marfanoid aortic disease, you know, all of these kinds of euphemisms are basically saying, we don't really know what's going on, but it looks kind of like this. And if we were to try and understand what the uh, long-term risk of having an aortic dissection was, we were dependent on population studies, or in fact, usually the studies in one large clinic where people followed a lot of people who had aneurysms, assumed that they were all the same thing, and assumed that the risk was stratified according to things that you could measure easily. And so this very nice table from um, Yale, from the uh, Alephiades group, the aortic surgery clinic there, that followed uh, about 3,000 people over time did a very interesting thing. And basically, it was try to determine what's the likelihood that somebody's going to either dissect or rupture their, their aorta just by looking at things that you can easily measure. And those things are aortic size. So by this time, it was easy enough to do echocardiograms or potentially other kinds of measure. And so here would be aortic diameter. And the other is body surface area. So taking into account both height and weight, with a large driver in that being height. And what you can see is that if you had very large aortas, almost no matter how big you were, not quite all the way to the end, you were in deep trouble. And you had a risk of aortic dissection of a, uh, a very high risk uh, within one year. If you, if you were small, and had aortic diameters just above the, the normal range, you had some risk, and you had a, a, an 8% per year of uh, having a dissection. But if your aortic diameters were small down here, or if you uh, were big, uh, you had relatively small risk. So it said that your aortic size is a determinant um, but also your, your size, your body surface area size. And this is the kind of thing that uh, planning ahead was, was based on. It wasn't based on what the underlying uh, cause of, uh, of the aneurysm was. And it made sense uh, because you could, you could work this out, and it didn't stratify according to, to other uh, aspects. The last two decades has really seen an increasing and very vigorous effort uh, to tease out the underlying cause of Marfan syndrome, to identify other genetic causes of aneurysmal disease uh, of the aorta and other vessels, and to search for mechanisms or gene-specific therapies. So the first has been quite successful, the second has been moderately successful, and the third is sort of just coming into its own. And the success for uh, identifying the basic causes of thoracic aneurysms has been good, it's not so good for abdominal aortic aneurysms unless they're part of a dissection that begins early on. And one of the most frustrating things, and certainly a clinical um, uh, condition that you see all the time, 
is isolated dissection of the carotids or the vertebral arteries, so the vessels of the head and neck. Um, our understanding of those, although they're common, they can be recurrent. We usually don't see them in families primarily because they tend to present late, but even when they present young, um, we have difficulties in finding them. So these were things that we would love to identify. So genetics and aneurysms, there's one basic rule, and this applies to almost genetics and anything, is that the younger the person in whom an aneurysm um, or some other common disorder is identified, and the more family members affected, the more likely it is that a genetic cause can be identified. So when we look at, at, um, at aneurysms, we find that uh, the genes that have been identified fall into a few different groups. So there are some that we think of as matrix cell signaling disorders. And these include now Marfan syndrome. And I'll talk to you about the mechanism for this uh, shortly. Lowy's Dietz syndrome, which is due to mutations in the uh, transforming growth factor beta receptor genes, um, a similar phenotype with mutations in SMAD3, which is part of the signaling pathway, which we'll see, and also mutations in TGF beta2. In cutis laxa, fibulin 4, which is an extracellular matrix protein, arterial tortuosity syndrome, the one recessive uh, disorder in this group uh, due to mutations in the glucose transporter, which actually interacts with the TGF beta receptor system. And then uh, bicuspid aortic valve with uh, uh, calcification due to mutations in NOTCH1. There are defects in extracellular matrix proteins, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type 4, a rare disorder that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail with mutations in type 3 collagen which is a major protein in the uh, arterial media. Osteogenesis imperfecta with mutations in type 1 collagen, very rare people in, in, with that have uh, aneurysms. And I think that there's a word of warning that needs to go there. And one of the aspects that we'll come back to later is how do we know that just because we have mutations in the type 1 collagen gene, that that's the cause of mutation. And that the way we're beginning to think about these disorders and the way we approach them really gives us a way to ask additional questions. And that is, are there other genes involved? And why wouldn't there be? Why does having a type 1 collagen mutation not put you at risk to have a more traditional cause or reason to have uh, aneurysms? Um, a rare recessive disorder, um, Ehlers-Danlos type 6, due to lysyl hydroxylase deficiency in which there's cross-linking of collagens and it's very clear that arterial walls are abnormal, and these people die from aneurysms and dissections. Menke syndrome, which is a copper defect, and ATP7A is a copper transporter. Copper is essential for collagen cross-linking, and defects in cross-linking uh, give rise to aortic aneurysms. You don't see it in Menke's because these kids all die young, but mutations in this gene that give you milder phenotypes and much uh, uh, <coughs> longer uh, life and cause a condition known as occipital horn syndrome are characterized by aneurysms. So again, the uh, connection. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type 1, mutations in type 5 collagen, occasional mutations in type 1 collagen also uh, are involved. And then an increasing array of intracellular proteins uh, that are seen in people who have um, defects in these proteins and people who have familial aortic aneurysms ACTA2, which is a smooth muscle cell myosin, myosin heavy chain 11, which is a large myosin in smooth muscle cells, and um, myosin-like chain kinase. So these identify players. They are not the full list of known players that do it. But in terms of people that we see in the clinic, they are the most likely candidates that we can see. So here's how this investigation started, not with this guy. But I think that you can see what's uh, going on with him. He's, uh, although he's sitting down, you get the sense he's a tall man. He's wearing glasses. He must have something wrong with his eyes. In fact, he has lens dislocation, um, very long, thin fingers. And here is <coughs> um, an aortogram. And this is his uh, ascending aorta here. His aortic valve would be here. You can see that the dye has gone back into the ventricles so that he has aortic insufficiency. And he has an ascending aortic aneurysm, 
with the diameter of the aorta reducing back to near normal by the time it reaches the arch. And this is a characteristic picture of what an aneurysm in somebody with Marfan syndrome looks like. So our young woman who came um, in, 1990, first in 1991, so if we back up a minute, uh, the gene for this was identified um, it, as a result of a, a confluence of things, looking at localization of the gene, mapping in families, and then test, isolating a protein, and then testing for mutations in that gene. And mutations in fibrillin-1 were identified. And fibrillin is an extracellular, or a large extracellular matrix protein um, that was the, the constituent of uh, microfibrils in the extracellular matrix. And so it was thought to be a structural protein that would maintain the structure, basically like oh, things like rebar and concrete. It would give you a, a structural platform on which to build elastic fibers, and it was that portion of things that kept things going. So this was sort of a depressing uh, sense. Not much you can do about a structural protein. You can't take it out. Uh, no matter how much rebar you've seen in your backyard, you know, taking out the concrete doesn't help you. It doesn't help you get to change the rebar. So it, um, it, it represented a problem in terms of therapy. Therapy was uh, surgical intervention, the use of antihypertensive drugs. And it's certainly the use of surgical intervention that's made a huge difference in these people and the, the development of techniques that uh, replace the ascending aorta and the, and the valve have made a difference and expanded, extended the lifespan of people with this from their late 40s into their 60s or 70s, so almost normalizing lifespan. So our young friend, uh, the young woman who was, wanted to be a, uh, a runner, actually was a very active runner, had testing for this uh, gene. And the laboratory identified a mutation in which the arginine uh, at position 132 in the chain, this is a chain that has about 2,600 amino acids, was replaced by a cysteine. And the laboratory described it as a classic Marfan mutation. Well, there's a. disconnect. She hasn't, her aortic root hasn't progressed. She has all of the skeletal findings. She has lens dislocation. And is this correct? Is the laboratory correct? Is that the right diagnosis? Well, there's no question that that's the mutation. I mean, th that's easy enough to accept. This is a good laboratory. So what do you do to find out whether this is is every mutation the same? Is the natural history for every mutation the same? So uh, we called the laboratory, and they said they had identified the mutation in three other people, uh, none of whom had dissections. Uh, the oldest was in the mid-30s or so, so it was probably a little bit too old. Then we were able to go to the literature and identify four papers that had been published with this mutation, exactly the same nucleotide, same mutation. There were 20 individuals, and in that in those papers and in those families, there were no dissections um, and very slow, if any, dilatation up to the age of 65. So her question, of course, was, well, if, this, if I were your daughter, would it be all right for me to run? And I said, yes. Because here's the idea is that not every mutation has exactly the same effect. And that's one of the very important things. You're going to be inundated with mutations. You're going to be inundated with genetic data. And you're going to have to know how to interpret those mutations. And because not every mutation in every gene is going to give you the same thing. You know that already. But you have to translate it into a, into a clinical setting. So I'm not sure it's helped her, but um, at least we're moving in that direction. So, when fibrillin was identified, it was thought to be this protein that was here. But beginning in the early, in the mid, uh, the early 2000s, uh, Enid Neptune in Hal Dietz's lab was very interested in trying to look at lung development and identified a very unusual thing about mice that had Marfan syndrome, uh, syndrome 
um, that they had abnormal lungs. And the abnormal lung uh, morphology appeared to be due to increased TGF beta signaling. So TGF beta is a ubiquitous signaling compound. And these cells were making far more TGF beta than they should have. And the consequence was that you got abnormal matrix development in the lung, and you got abnormal matrix development in the, uh, in the aorta uh, that could be cured by uh, treating the mice with, T, uh, with uh, anti-TGF uh, beta antibodies. So very striking. And TGF beta is made as a latent protein, and this latent protein binds to Marfan syndrome. So the concept evolved that if you don't make enough fibrillin, or if the structure of the fibrillin is not normal, this TGF beta, which normally is held here, is actually free, and it now binds to cells and signals. And the signaling pathway is complex. This is from a very pretty review by uh, Mark Lindsay and Hal Dietz in Nature from last year. So the TGF beta is a latent compound, is bound to um, the fibrillin uh, microfibrils. It's then released. It releases. It interacts with TGF uh, beta receptors, and they that sets off a, a cascade of events in the cell that involves signaling proteins, the SMAD proteins, um, and a variety of other proteins that then interact, go into the nucleus, and activate a series of um, uh, genes in the nucleus. What this did, as much as anything, was identify a set of candidates that could have mutations in them and could give rise to uh, phenotypes that have aneurysms. And in fact, now we know that mutations in TGF beta 2, one of three uh, forms of TGF beta, in the receptors themselves, in the SMAD3 protein, um, SMAD4 is another example. It binds uh, mutations in it usually give rise to hereditary uh, hemorrhagic uh, telangiectasia. Um, but identifies a pathway in the cell that gives rise to, when they're uh, abnormal, give rise to aneurysms. So this syndrome, which has become known as Lois Dietz syndrome, but probably should be called uh, Mizuguchi Boileau syndrome, because they published the paper a year earlier about mutations in the TGF beta receptor 2 um, uh, gene is characterized by uh, aneurysms that occur and in a wide range. So they can occur in young children. The youngest one we've studied in whom we identified a mutation was six months old, who died from aortic rupture at six months. We also have people who are in their 60s, 70s, and probably 80s who have mutations that are very similar or the same as ones that can give rise to the pediatric onset. Uh, who have not had aortic dissections, whose aortas may be close to normal. In the classic forms, or the, the very mark, uh, markedly obvious forms of this disorder, um, uh, young children and adults have hypertelorism, which means that the eyes are a little bit further apart than usual. <clears throat> and they have one very striking clinical finding, um, which is they, they may, not all of them, have a bifid uvula. So most of you don't know whether your spouse or partner has a single or bifid uvula. I, I learned this um, from clinical experience, not from personal experience, you understand. When one of the patients that we saw um, who came in with a 56 millimeter aorta, aortic root, and I was examining him, he was normal, except when he opened his mouth, he had a the most typical bifid uvula I have ever seen, most dramatic one. And they said, oh, you have a bifid uvula. And he said, yes, of course I do. His wife, who was sitting there in the room, said, what? And I realized that there are certain things we don't usually do with our spice or partners. Um, and looking deeply into their mouth is one. We may look deeply into their eyes, but <clears throat> it's somehow this is sacrosanct. So we have become uvulologists. Um, and <clears throat> we can describe in great detail what the uvula looks like. Is it long? Is it short? Does it go up into the palate when people say, ah? 
Is it bifid? Do you have to tease it apart, tease, tease the two parts apart? Does it have a median rafe that tells you that it hasn't separated normally? Um, is it just bifid at the tip? Um, and how do you do this? Very simple test. You just look. You open the mouth. You look in. You do it with Bill. He would know. He, and I'm sure he has a single uvula. We'll get to you later. <laughs> So that's a very striking thing. And it says that there's something going on in, in the midline. And some of these people have uh, left palates. But the striking thing is that they have uh, a very large, enlarged aortic root. And as they get older, the abnormalities are not limited to the root, but may involve the rest of the artery. The aorta is often tortuous. And you can see here in this very pretty picture that there's um, arterial tortuosity. So an easy diagnosis to make, but, but really quite uncommon. Probably about the same frequency, perhaps a little less than Marfan syndrome. So about 1 in 10,000 people in the population, perhaps a little bit less, perhaps a little bit more. We don't know. Another <clears throat> uh, gene in that pathway, SMAD3, was identified more recently, 2011. Here you can see the face looks a little bit similar, eyes a little bit further apart. Here's this wincy little partially bifid uvula. If you can look carefully, you can see that at the end there, this little dip up there, that's a partially bifid uvula. And you have to remember that bifid uvulas are not uncommon in the general population. Probably about 1% of people have them. So like mitral prolapse, uh, like many other common things in the population, you're more likely to see normal people with these variants than you are going to see people who have uh, disorders like this. The striking thing about people who have SMAD3 mutation, or at least in the initial set, is <clears throat> that they may present with early uh, osteoarthritis, abnormalities in the spine, where you can see in the thumb, and a cyst here in the knee. So early involvement of another system. And in fact, one of the families that we've identified has only osteoarthritis, or at least up until the 50s, that's been the case. And yet the same mutation found in another family, one family in <coughs> Toronto, one family in Sydney, has uh, the full-blown set of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, vascular disease. So it says that in addition to having an underlying mutation, there are often modifying factors and modifying genetic factors that make a difference in the clinical presentation. We're not sure what they are at this point. TGF beta 2. <clears throat> so this is the newest uh, person on the block, the newest uh, disorder on the block. These people are, they, they were pulled out of a pool <clears throat> of people who had a Marfan like or Lois Dietz like presentation and uh, turned out to have mutations in the TGF beta 2 gene itself. Um, one of those families comes from here, and that was the guy whose mouth opened, and um, lo and behold, there's this huge bifid uvula. Physical examination otherwise was normal. I couldn't see anything else that would suggest that he had anything except something in this pathway. And at that time, we didn't know about this gene. One of our colleagues was working on it. We sent them a few samples, and lo and behold, this was one of them that turned up. We've now screened another 250 or so people, and we've only found a couple more. So it's not a very common presentation. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that they were concerned about in this group was whether or not they had normal intellect. And the thing that I had to say with this guy who is a practicing physician elsewhere is that um, there was no issue about his intellect. His sense of humor uh, was a little unusual when I asked him. <clears throat> um, how many endoscopies he did per day, he said 13 and a half. That worried me a little bit. <laughs> I didn't want to be the half. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's another, another gene in this pathway. All of those are dominantly inherited. We see them in families. When we look at families, um, <clears throat> we may see enormous variation in the clinical presentation. But we can identify the people that have it. And the significance of having the gene in hand is that we can, we can 
isolate people away from having to have yearly echocardiogram. And it's a tremendous cost saving. And the testing itself is a few hundred dollars, and it's, you've done that in one round of echocardiography or uh, CT or MRI scanning. You think genetic testing is expensive, we think it's cheap. And we think in the long run, it's very cheap. Here's a, <clears throat> the only recessive disorder in this group, um, arterial tortuosity syndrome. Here's the father, the mother, uh, and here are the, um, uh, the uh, CT angiograms. And you can see he's got nice straight carotids go up. He has nice straight carotids. She has nice straight carotids. And you need a road map to drive this road. You can see they're very dramatically uh, abnormal in the way they course. Tortuosity is characteristic of <clears throat> the um, vessels in people who have TGF-beta pathway mutations. The interaction, the way in which this interacts with TGF-beta is unclear. This is actually a glucose transporter that's in both the nuclear and the cell membrane. And it's not clear how it actually mediates uh, the phenotype. It's rare. We've never seen anybody here with it. Um, so if we move from the signaling pathways to people who have mutations in the structural part of the vessels, the first place we get to are, are people that have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type 4, a relatively uncommon disorder. Uh, but over the years, we've been uh, studying people. We've been able to collect uh, more than 600 families with this from around the country, a total of uh, over uh, 1,200 people. And what that allows you to do is to really look at variation within that group and natural history and trying to pull apart all the different kinds of things. And we can do that in part because these are mutations in the type 3 collagen gene. Um, and almost every family in that group has a private mutation. So we begin to see the difference in presentation with different mutations. And within a family, we can see stratification and see what happens with the same mutation on potentially different uh, genetic backgrounds. People with this disorder. Uh, are at risk for arterial, bowel, and uterine rupture. In some, they have, um, uh, the characteristic thing is that they have very easy to see um, uh, venous patterning that you can see here on her chest and over her uh, abdominal wall. Patients, ACTA2, a smooth muscle actin. And what you can see is that they have uh, thoracic aneurysms. Those are the black ones here. But they also have livido reticularis, or some of them do. Now, I don't know. You know, I get livido reticularis when I'm cold. I think almost everybody does. Um, but this is supposed to be fixed livido reticularis. In, a, in the small number of people we've seen with this, I can't convince myself that I've ever actually seen it. Here's the picture of what it's supposed to look like. And you see this um, fixed uh, uh, markings on the skin. When they looked at these families in more detail, so this was the first set, There's a sub, and this family is a subset of this group, they recognized that there were other things present at the same time. Premature coronary artery disease, premature stroke in addition to that, and a rare vascular disease called Moya Moya disease where there's obliteration of the, of the uh, cerebral vessels. And when you look in families, you can see people, for example, um, here who have premature uh, coronary artery disease who do not appear to have aortic dilatation. So it's something to think about in that context. A young person with coronary disease, you don't have any idea about why. They have normal lipid levels. They have normal uh, blood pressure. Ask about their family history. Ask about it. Because that will be, you may find what's going on at that point. We come back to our guy, our friend here, talked about earlier. He has an ACTA2 mutation. Uh, the presumption is that he did too because one of his sons also has it. We haven't been able to test the other one, but uh, and we haven't been able to test these people. So he has, you know, he had nothing more than ordinary clinical presentations. I'm not a bad doctor. I'm not a terrific doctor, but I know what to look for in people with this. 
And I could not find anything else. I had to make it up that he had Virgo reticularis. Um, and I don't, I don't think he did. One other gene that's involved is the myosin heavy chain. And we can see here, this is again an intracellular protein, the aortic aneurysm here. And again, you can see premature um, uh, coronary artery disease in the absence of aortic aneurysm. Here you see that, here you see it both. So again, ask about aneurysms in the family in those people who have coronary disease because it may be the clue uh, to where you're going. The big actor in all of this, and the one we really don't talk about much because we really don't know what the basis of it is, is bicuspid aortic valve. So the, the aortic valve is normally tricuspid, but bicuspid valves affects probably somewhere in the order of one in 200 people. And if you look at people who have, have aortic stenosis uh, that's calcified when they're older, a significant portion of them have a bicuspid aortic valve. They are at significant risk for having uh, aortic aneurysms. And in some instances, they will uh, expand in the sinuses, just like they do in people with Marfan syndrome. But more commonly, they seem to uh, expand in the uh, area above the sinotubular junction. And so you get uh, aortic, ascending aortic dilatation without necessarily uh, sinus dilatation. And sometimes you get a sausage-like or tube-like expansion. It's not, th this is genetic. It's clearly genetic, but there's huge variation in the, uh, the likelihood of having a bicuspid valve in a, in a family. And this has not yet been solved. There is one very small subset of people that has very early calcification that you can see here who have mutations in notch one, but there are only a couple of families like that that are affected. It's dominant, and they come to attention because they have uh, valvular disease in their teens or 20s. So Jim Evans, if you were lucky enough to hear him uh, at the Matulski lecture last Friday, was talking about how the new approaches to DNA sequence analysis allow us to make the rare common. And it took me a while to figure out what he was talking about and um, to understand. And this is actually a very real example. We have spent the last 20 or 30 years trying to define better and better the, the kinds of mutations that occur and the genes that are involved in aortic aneurysms, a not terribly common disorder, that affects probably, you'll see 100,000 people per year come to clinical attention in this country because of it. It means that we have a few hundred uh, in our metropolitan area that will come to attention because of, of uh, aortic aneurysm. How do you decide what to do? So you just saw these pictures. Do you remember what they had? Right? It's not a test. I know what they had because I know where the pictures came from. These have TGF beta receptors. These are SLC2A mutations. And these people all have type 3 collagen mutations. What about them? Who in that group has a name? Anybody? These could be my next door neighbors. They could be your next door neighbors. They came to attention because she had a cerebral and he has the same mutation. So what are you going to do? Do you think you're good enough clinicians to decide what gene is involved? I'm not. I can't tell. So we can test, but how do we go about testing? What do we do? Well, you're, you've been running panels for years, right? SMA started off as SMA small, SMA got bigger, there became SMA 12, and then it became SMA 25, and now it's probably up to SMA 200. I don't know how many things there are in it. That's a panel. You only want the information from a couple of those values. You can begin to do that now with genetic testing. You don't need to know what these people have. And I, I cannot tell you how uncomfortable I am with this. Because to some extent, this is the most anti-intellectual approach to medicine you can imagine. You don't need to know what it is. You can just test, right? But the point is that what it does is we use one test, or we're developing, we're at the point almost, of one test 
for all these people, each one of which is rare, but when we aggregate them, we can make this like a more common disorder. So when we test all the individuals with a relatively small number of genes, we find about 15% you know, of people have a variant or something wrong. Remember, thinking and decision-making are expensive. You're very expensive. Testing is actually technology is cheap. Do it once, do it all, and then pick the ones that are abnormal. You're used to this as a strategy, but you, the tests are cheaper. How much is doing all of those tests at the same time? Well, now it's probably about $5,000. What's it going to be like in about three years? It's probably going to be a few hundred dollars. It's going to be that way because the technology is changing very rapidly. It's going to be possible to have this information back to you in a very short time. And technology is changing. The costs will decline from a few thousand dollars to a few hundred dollars, and the time to the result will decrease from hours to days, or, or you know, from, from weeks or months to hours to days. And you will be able to have this in your hand in a relatively short time. It is not a new idea. It's simply the application of new technologies which can sequence genes very rapidly and get information back to you very quickly and understand what variants and what mutations mean. That's a big part. We're not sure that we're as good at that as we should be. So the message is, you know, you, can, you don't have to know what the answer is. You know, in medicine, we like to think we know what the answer is before we do the test, and that we're verifying what we know. And the answer in this is, you may not know what the answer is, except that this person has an aneurysm. And that's good enough. That's good enough. It makes a difference in terms of family. It's ultimately cost effective. You know, the cost of MRIs and CTs is not going to come down as quickly as the cost of genetic testing. Genetic testing is going to plummet. The other ones are going to stay up because they're very expensive machines and they're, they make a lot of money. And we're, you know, as usual, genetics is going to be out in the, out in the woodshed. We're not making money anymore, but, uh, but it is the way to do it. So a number of people have been involved with these disorders, and certainly the families are among the most important. Uh, Ulrika, Melanie, Drew, Mitzi, and, and uh, Margaret have been important. Our funding comes from these sources and from the College of Diagnostic. So thanks. Pleasure to be here.